Hey, good afternoon. I'm Farmer Lee Jones. I'm here with Chef Jamie Simpson. Chef Jamie Simpson is the chef liaison at the Culinary Vegetable Institute. Uh, our family has been farming here in this uh, community in Huron, Ohio for the last 50 years. We're in an amazing microclimate here, uh, right along Lake Erie. Lake Erie, of course, is the shallowest of all the Great Lakes. Consequently, it's the warmest and it creates an amazing microclimate. This area actually was huge in grapes even before uh, Napa Valley. Uh, we grow about 700 different types of vegetables and we actually grow them directly for chefs. Over the last 35 years, our primary focus has been working directly with chefs. Uh, we, we're in the commercial wholesale business and uh, we actually, uh, hit a point where uh, interest rates hit 22% and we had a hailstorm. We ended up losing the farm and we started over and uh, met a chef who had trained in Europe and was, uh, you know, really forceful, I guess, or encouraging in encouraging us to look at growing products without the chemical, growing for the flavor and the integrity of the product rather than the tons per acre. And, after we had lost the farm, that really resonated with us and made sense for us to refocus. And we start back at farmer's markets. And then Iris Balin, a chef, train, train, uh, actually introduced us to chefs, Parker Bosley at first, and then another chef, and then another chef. And then finally, our family made the decision to switch completely to focusing on chef's needs. And that's really been what, what's been our driving force for the last 35 years. Yeah, it's been amazing and uh, really interesting, ultimately, what, um, what, what, what brought me here. You know, as a customer of the farm for, um, for many years at a restaurant in Charleston and, um, and just fell in love with this box of vegetables that arrived every, uh, every week. You know, it was like Christmas. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, reconnecting with agriculture, and reconnecting with the seasons, re connecting with a farmer and having a relationship with a farmer allowed us to put food on the table in the dining room that was, you know, really unlike anything else, um, you know, it, it, that the town had, which was really, really amazing. Uh, now, you mentioned, like, farming for, like, 50 years. Now, that's, that's pretty impressive. Happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I think it would be important for us to talk about, you know, one of the really interesting that, things that, that we've found is that and I would challenge you guys, everybody that's listening, Google this, look for the information yourselves, read about it. From 1930 to 2020, the nutritional levels have actually gone down by over 50%, and they're going down at an increasing rate. In vegetables. In vegetable, in vegetable, yeah. in vegetable down by over 50% from 1930 to 2020. It's not sustainable. And, you know, we're using chemical and synthetic inputs to prop up these plants and we produce higher yields, more tons per acre. But in the meantime, the integrity and the nutritional levels just keep tanking. When we lost the farm, it gave us a chance to kind of rethink what the heck are we doing? And we started looking back at agricultural books. My dad had a saying that the only thing we're trying to do is get as good as the growers are were a hundred years ago. And what's interesting is, is that a hundred years ago, the nutritional levels were 50% or more higher than they are today. Well, how are they farming? What can we learn from them? And how did we get so far off track that we're now growing product 50% less nutritious? It's crazy, right? So you start looking at the way they were farming. A large farm was about 100 acres. 100 acres divided by three. A third of it was sitting fallow. If you can go back to biblical times and see that they were doing that, even into the Old Testament. A third of it was in pasture to feed the animals. A third of it was to grow product to take to market. And they rotated the next year. You were always rebuilding the soil. Interestingly enough, you know, over the last 35 years, chefs have said the three most important things that they wanted from us were flavor was first, flavor was second, and flavor was third. And, you know, so we've really gone about looking for ways to be able to get the soil in balance because we believe Ultimately, it all comes down to the balance in the soil. But we thought, you know, as a hypothesis that, 
probably as we were bringing the flavors or increasing the flavors, and I'm not talking about genetic vod- modification or any voodoo, I'm talking about just good balance in the soil and rebuilding that soil naturally rather than chemically, that we were probably bringing the nutritional levels. So we're actually sitting here in a lab uh, that we built right in the middle of the farm. You know, we jokingly talk about going out to harvest some vitamin D and capturing some sunshine. There's so much more truth to that than you can even imagine. And what we found is there's a correlation between the type of plants that we plant in the soil and the types of energy that we can harness or harvest from the sun. So what we're doing is we're doing lab analysis on the soil, just like if you were to go and have blood work drawn at the hospital or at the doctor's office to find out what you were deficient, high in iron, low in iron, high in calcium, low in calcium. Then based on those deficiencies, then we're planting crop specific. So it could be clover, buckwheat, alfalfa, vetch, rye. We have a 15 species planting that we plant into the fields. Two thirds of the acreage is committed to just harvesting the sun's energy. It's an unprecedented commitment to rebuilding the energy in the soil naturally rather than chemically uh, or synthetically. What we're seeing in results is in many cases up to three, 300 to 500 percent above USDA average. That's pretty great news right. to think we can reverse that trend. And those are things like uh, beta carotenes and irons and uh, minerals. Calcium, all the minerals, all the trace elements. Absolutely. So you think that there's a direct correlation between uh, like flavor and nutrient density is uh, is great. Right. I it's mean, kind of it's, your body's way of saying, you know, you're at the grocery store, you're at a farmer's market, and it tastes delicious. You know, generally, you know, it is right and nutritious, also. Well, and what we're finding is in large scale production where they're doing it, and I don't fault the farmers. The farmers are following a system or a model that exists, and that is keep the cost as low as possible and to produce as many tons per acre as you can. And if you keep the cost low and produce enough tons per acre, you stay in business. And so I don't fault the farmers. They're trying to survive within the model that exists. Fortunately or unfortunately, I would say fortunately, we got off of that bandwagon. And we're actually testing some stuff in box stores, in large grocery stores. We're going and purchasing it, bringing it back to the lab, and testing. There's this assumption that a carrot is a carrot is a carrot is a carrot, and it just didn't sow. And so we're seeing huge differences in how the product's being grown. Interestingly enough, the bigger the product is, the lower the nutrient levels. The smaller it is, the higher the nutrient levels. So kind of interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, you know, The farm, I think, as a, as a general rule, you can find almost uh, almost ten thousand available products this time of year, you know, and, and and you know the farm's only growing, you know, maybe six hundred varieties of vegetables. You know, how do you get to ten thousand products available from six hundred varieties of things? How does that happen? Lots of combinations. <laughs> yeah. And picking them at different stages. I mean, one yeah. of the things that we've learned is that at every single stage of the plant's life, it offers something unique to the plate. And I think that we can do more single-handedly. I mean, unless you've been living under a rock for the last three years, you know that we have a food waste issue in this country. Everybody's seen the commercial with a 40% food waste. I think, quite frankly, it's understated. But I think that we can do more to reduce waste in this country by understanding the ebbs and flows of seasons, but also, you know, looking at those plants in a different way than we've had billions of dollars of marketing conditioning us to know that this is the size that we pick a zucchini. Yeah. This is the shape. This is, it's got to be perfect, the perfect tomato. And really kind of blowing out of that mind process and looking beyond. Right. Yeah. Jamie's got oh. a good example here. No, that, I think that zucchini will stick with, you know, as a, in, the, in the restaurant uh, specifically, you know, as a the chef, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to work seasonally, right? It's, it's midsummer, uh, it's zucchini season. I'm going to pick up the phone and this magical box of uh, zucchini has arrived, right? And it arrives tomorrow. And we don't know where it came from. We don't know who grew it. We just know that it fits perfectly in the box, right, for shipping purposes. Right. We know that. Uh, and for efficiency. It's harvested at, a, 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 you know, a, a metric of tons per acre, right, when the when the zucchini is as big as it's going to get before it, you know, deteriorates, 
um, and that's got a long shelf life, right? And that's the zucchini that every chef in every restaurant around this country generally orders when they pick up the phone and a magical box of zucchini arrives tomorrow. What I love about this model, right, um, wasting less, um, using every single part of the plant, is that a zucchini, uh, like the carrot, is, is not just a, a zucchini. Right? It can exist uh, in, in, in stages as small as your thumbnail, right? Um, as it develops, you'll see these little blooms attached, right? And as it continues to grow, it gets a little bit bigger and then obviously uh, more standard. But beyond that, there's the squash blossoms and the squash leaves and the squash stems. And the whole plant is of value um, and it is a beautiful representation of, of the farm. Right. The thing that started us all with Iris Balin's discovery of a farmer willing to grow squash blossoms for her. 35 um, years ago. Yeah, has really culminated into this concept that is all about, at the end of the day, sustainable agriculture. And I think it's really important uh, and a really great point. Yeah, on. and you know, we're kind of really, sustainable agriculture is sort of a buzzword that's sort of run its day. When you think about sustainable agriculture, if you think about the word, if you break the word down, sustain, it means to kind of hang on, to sustain yourself, to keep alive, to keep going. And we don't like that word. And so, you know, I think that the new new word, new terminology that we're trying to really build around is regenerative. You know, in the old days, a farmer, um, his goal or her goal was to leave the land in better condition for future generations. And that's a noble thought process. It's it's still one of our primary goals to leave the land in better condition because everything ultimately starts with the soil. But regenerative is not just sustaining, but to grow, to build, to be able to support and to be able to carry on and continue. But it also has to go further. We have a saying, healthy soil, healthy vegetables, healthy people, healthy environment. We have to create an environment here on the farm that is sustainable and regenerative for the team members, that we can pay them a wage that encourages and motivates quality people to want to be on the farm rather than going to other other parts or other jobs, other occupations. You know, you, you want good agriculture, you got to have good people doing it, and you've got to be able to give them a fair wage. You've got to be able to build in hospitalization, vacation time, sick days. You want them to be able to for their families to be able to follow their dreams and to send their children to the schools of their choices and have the automobiles of their choices and all the things that drive all of us. And so it's really, you know, I, I say this so often, the thing that's the most amazing about our farm, and I think of any farm, isn't the land, isn't the greenhouses, isn't the tractors, isn't the equipment, it's the people. And that's really, really the key is, you know, having great people that understand regenerative agriculture, that we're building and growing the land, but the people, and and of course, then taking care of our environment. And that's so critical. Well, I'm gonna give you one example that I think is really cool. We have a farm near us that's not ours, that uh, it's a neighbor and he farms about 3000 acres of popcorn. And as a byproduct of popcorn, he's got thousands of tons of corn cobs and he has to pay to haul them away because it's a it's a waste product for him. And he ha was hauling it over eight miles and then having to pay by the ton to get rid of it. And we worked out an arrangement with him to deliver it less than one mile. We now give him $26 a ton for a product that he was driving over eight miles to get rid of and then having to pay to get rid of it. And we, we took down four acres of greenhouse that was about two hours away from here, 50-year-old greenhouse, and we repurposed it. Farmers are always saving everything. And we put it on the best piece of land that we had. And then we put a boiler system in. And then we get the corn cobs from them. And the corn cobs are what fuels the boiler. And then we ran a million foot of tubing through the ground in the soil. And we heat the water, run the hot water through the tubes, and heat the, heat the greenhouse through the use of the corn cobs. It's a renewable energy. We're not using a fossil fuel. The farmer wins. The environment wins, the customer wins, everybody wins in that situation. Yeah, that's an, an unbelievable. Um, just to think about, first of all, $26 a ton delivered. That's pretty amazing. That's a good rate. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Compared to paying to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, to your last point, you know, you were talking about just you know, 
the regenerative model, you know, the, the, the value of the people um, that, that work the land. I really think that there's a lot of parallels between that and today's restaurant industry. You know, the restaurant industry today is, is, is 100%, you know, based and built on human capital, right? It's their lives dedicated to making a better dinner, right, than yesterday. What are the actual costs of food? You know, how much does, how much does food actually cost, right? Uh, you know, beyond human lives, and maybe you can get it cheaper from this place, but we don't know, like, the kinds of conditions that that thing was raised in, and they're going to keep... Or the kind of conditions the people that were taking care of that were taken care of. Yeah. yeah you know? exactly. And that's a huge part of it. Yeah, it really is. So it's this whole kind of whole, like, sort of now that we're living in, and I'm really excited about the future of the restaurant model. I'm seeing a lot of uh, chefs coming out of this industry looking at different ways to take care of his or her team. Um, and it's really amazing looking at extra days off or four day work weeks or, you know, different things that are, uh, has been really interesting in the, uh, um, restaurant model. It's very competitive, right? Hiring right now has um, been really interesting. So it's, it's been really cool also to see the same kind of approach that we have always done here, um, that is really leaning into the, the future of today's, uh, food service industry. It's pretty cool. For sure. And, you know, if you think if you think about, let's take for example a Brussels sprout plant. It takes ten months from seed to fruition, and it grows into this three and a half, four foot tall, beautiful plant. You have all this energy, all this resources, all the water, all the nutrients, all the love that goes into growing these plants. And he's got these beautiful leaves that provide a canopy or a foliage to be able to keep the Brussels sprout from being sunburned. And then we go in and we just pick the Brussels sprout off and you have this whole plant. And so, so much energy is being wasted because the only part we're eating is the Brussels sprout. And it's been really amazing to see what Chef Jamie has been able to do over at the Culinary Vegetable Institute. I would defy you guys, if you were blindfolded, to be able to tell the difference in a Brussels sprout leaf and a collard green. They're in the cruciferous family, same as cabbage. Cauliflower, broccoli, Turnip. collards, turnips, yeah, Brussels sprouts, all the same family, cruciferous. So we can eat those leaves of the Brussels sprout. You can use them as a ladle. You, there's so many different applications for more parts of the plant than, we're, than we've ever really considered before. In addition, Sammy actually found a way that you can peel the outer skin off of that Brussels sprout and be able to use the inner part of the stalk as a vegetable marrow. You know, in Europe, over the hundreds of years they've had to survive, there's been some lean times in those time periods, and they found every way to use every portion of an animal, the gelatin, uh, the hoof, the tongue, uh, everything but the squeal and the hog uh, has been, they found a way to be able to use it. But I can think of no greater way to be able to respect the plant than to be able to utilize the entire plant and celebrate its life and using all that energy than to find ways to be able to use 100% of it. It's it's really kind of exciting. Yeah, like it, it's all about, um, back to back to the original point, you know, the model currently in the agricultural world as it sits, is, it's unfortunately about tons per acre. You know, it's not about that, you know, but if you were to think about using every part of the plant, that's how you really maximize yield. The Brussels sprout itself is maybe only 10% of the plant's mass. Right. Right. So let, let's look. Like, or the energy that goes into it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's look at the rest of this whole situation here and see if we can find ways to work that into our menu. It doesn't make sense. You know, farmers are growing uh, uh, parsley next to carrots and they cut the parsley tops off and sell those and they cut the carrot tops off and you know, throw those back into the field. It's, uh, it's kind of an interesting, crazy model. Uh, cool. They're in the same family. And none of this stuff has to be wasted. Yeah. I mean, there, it's really a situation where 100% utilization. Yeah. You, know, you do the trimmings, you do the roots, you do the leaves, and those go into a vegetable stock. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Or a, a vegetable tea or whatever you can come up with. But there's absolutely no reason for any waste. Yeah. Um, it, which kind of brings us to the book. You know, this, um, the, the, the cookbook is uh, one that, you know, I think we've spent the last, uh, you know, four years on-ish. Yeah, 
I'd say I'd say the last forty years. Yeah, a farmer a farmer will say we've been working on this book for forty years. Um, a lot of trials, a lot of tribulations, a lot of failures, yeah. and maybe a couple of successes. Yeah, um, but really over the last uh, four years, it's been kind of organized into this sort of comprehensive uh, read. You know, and a lot of your stories, a lot of your points that you brought up today are really focused in here. Those great stories and elaboration on each. Um, but the, the culmination of recipes in this book are focused around the title itself, you know, A Modern Guide to Common and Unusual Vegetables. We're looking at um, you know, unusual parts of usual vegetables, like the Brussels sprout leaves that he mentioned before, and um, just unusual vegetables in general that you may never see. Um, and we think it's a, a pretty interesting culmination of... Um, of like textbook entry, of anecdotes, of like farms history and storytelling, um, and then um, some real practical ways to utilize these vegetables and how to incorporate them into, um, you know, any menu, um, any time of year. For sure. We shot it in four different sequences, um, spring, summer, winter, fall. Now, uh, we all know that seasons don't simply align in, into like these little four bucket, four menus. For the first three months, the second three months, right. Yeah, it doesn't work like There's that. There's overlap for sure. Um, we just love, I think that, you know, if, if it were up to me, there would be, you know, 365 uh, you know, seasons, uh, you know, and every day would be a different day. It's really the way the farm operates, you know, with like these, like these garlic scapes. Garlic scapes exist, you know, they come and go. Um, and it's just a small section of, of spring, right? And I think that's, that's really interesting. Uh, carrot blooms, you know, how long will we get to see these? Not, not real long. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, for thousands of years, the only thing that we did was eat the top of the carrot. And it seems in the last couple of hundred years, we forgot about the top. And now all we eat is the root, the carrot, this part. Right, you know. For a culture, it was it was only an herb and a spice. It was not a vegetable. Um, so let's get back to that. Let's eat more uh, eat more carrot blooms. How does it happen though? You know, you don't um, you don't often find uh, carrot blooms at the at the grocery store. No. How do you get those? No. <laughs> know thy farmer. And you know, I would encourage you to you know get to the farmers markets, build relationships. We allowed a disconnect in America. All the preservatives that have been added into the food over the last 50 to 60 to 70 years. And, you know, it kind of slipped away from us. We lost our connection with where our food was coming from. It happened after World War II when, you know, before that, one, one parent stayed at home and tended to the family. And uh, during the World War, both parts of the family were asked to, to come out of the home and they built machine guns and army tanks and submarines and they, to win the war. After the war was over, society recognized that we could be a two-income household, and so now both parents were working out of the home. Maybe you guys are too young to remember, but when I was a kid, they had the, the invention of the frozen TV dinner, yeah. and we thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. It was this nasty Salisbury steak and instant mashed potatoes and frozen carrots and peas, and mom thought it was great. She was working away from home. Dad was working out in the fields, and she could pop it out of the freezer and put it in the oven for 30 minutes and dinner was done. It was garbage, but it was a convenience and everything moved towards convenience. And so we allowed the pendulum to swing too far. And now it becomes up to you guys to write that, to get it rebalanced, to, to reconnect with where our producers are from and how they're producing and how they're taking care of the land, how they're taking care of the people, how they're taking care of the environment. All of these things really need to play in. You all are going to become future purchasers, and you all could support the beliefs that are important to us that are really necessary for regenerative agriculture, but just for sustainability of society. It's not somebody else's job. It's our job. We have to do it. It's up to us. Oh, I, We're just so excited to get to talk to you guys today, and um, I hope that you guys uh, – will share with us what you're doing on a continued basis. Farmer Lee Jones on Instagram. Uh, and uh, Jamie Simpson, are, are you on Instagram? Yeah, the Culinary Vegetable Culinary Institute. Culinary Vegetable really Institute, like, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, going back to that point, uh, you know, know thy farmer. 
I think it's like, it's like sort of like playing into like the metric or notion of local, right? It's like, it's not just about being, um, you know, 10 to 15 miles or 20 miles or 100 miles or whatever. It's just, you, local is, is only, I think, you know, most importantly, a unit of a distance of, of, of measure, right? It's, it's like from here to here. It doesn't mean that it's better. It doesn't mean that it's better for the environment. It doesn't mean that the farmers are taking care of the farm. It doesn't mean that, you know, the, 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 the vegetables are free of any ridiculous um, chemicals that shouldn't be on them. Um, it just means that it's, it's close. And I think um, I just wanted to also sort of touch on that as, as this future generation sort of gets to navigate the world of, uh, of things, you know, to not only look at um, their products as a unit of measure, um, but also as a unit of measure of quality. And I think that's just something I wanted to touch on. I think it's important, um, you know, it's not just about the, the guy next door. Tell me about the apple farmer. <laughs> we, you know, the out in the country, we don't sell things to our neighbors. We trade. And I have uh, an true. amazing neighbor. They're the best neighbors you could ever ask for. They, um, they actually met the day they married. It was a prearranged marriage. Uh, they were from Sicily, and they came over here, and they're the American dream. She became a registered nurse. He worked at the Ford Motor Company. They raised six beautiful children. If I called him at 2 o'clock in the morning and said, I need help, he would be there. If he called me at 2 o'clock in the morning and said, help, I would be there. It's a beautiful relationship. Um, his family farmed back in Italy, and even though he worked full-time at Ford, he always had a little orchard. And... Uh, he loves our fava beans, and he found out that we do shelled fava beans. Well, it takes about three people an hour to do a pound of shelled favas. So every year he asks us for a five-pound box of shelled favas, which equates to some few, a few dollars. Well, he, you have to have an applicator's license to spray chemicals, and growing apples uh, without chemicals takes some real doing. And... He doesn't have an applicator's license and he doesn't know how to apply the chemicals, but he'll go buy chemical from anybody can get to sell it to him. And they spray the shit out of the apples. And uh, so he brings me over a bushel of apples with a value of about $5 on the open market. And we give him a $150 box of shelled fava beans every year. Like and I won't feed the apples to my horses. Now, the point is not to throw my neighbor under the table. I'm not mentioning names. He's the best neighbor. He and his wife are the best neighbors you could ever imagine. The point is, is that it's def local defines distance. It doesn't define what is our purpose. How are we taking care of the people? How are we taking care of the environment? How are we taking care of the product? Look, if you can get it in your backyard at the green market, green city market, do it. If you've got an established relationship with a firm, do it. It's my point is, and I think Jamie's point is, don't, don't build your mindset around a distance. Dis local defines a distance. It doesn't define the integrity of a product. Can you imagine any restaurant in New York City saying, I'm only going to allow customers to come in that are within a 25-mile radius of New York? It thrives on a global marketplace. It hasn't thrived in the last year. None of us have on a global market. But anyway, we just throw that out there for you to kind of chew on, no pun intended, and think about that philosophically and think about it. No, I think it's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's sort of a hot button topic. It's definitely like an emotional one. I think lately like, people will, um, you know, I'd love to hear some comments and thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, local is spewed out of people's mouths like it's the next coming. Mm -hmm. And I think that when it was initially started, it was well intended and maybe not well thought out. I think now we're in phase two. We're in generation two of this. And let's look globally at this whole concept of how is the land being taken care of? How are the people being taken care of? How's the environment being taken care of? And what's the integrity of the food? Yeah, what's yeah. really amazing about the concept overall is that it, you know, it, it allows for so much beautiful like regional distinction of food. Absolutely. You know, when you look at a, a country like Italy, it's really, really small. Um, but there are regions that are just slamming with different concepts, you know, the different things that they, they pride and different things that they grow. Um, I love that. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's a really important um, to, that, that North America, you know, in America or the world in general creates and maintains this regional distinction in food. It's what, it's what 
we travel for. You know, it's why we, we get out of our, our town is to go experience another one. And I think that's very important to, to measure. And speaking of traveling and, uh, and not traveling and, uh, um, you know, dining and not dining and restaurants and no restaurants, um, uh, you guys have been pretty busy this year. We all have really in, um, in this like home delivery model. Yeah. Talk about that a little. I mean, if you imagine... You know, 100% of our revenue was directly tied to selling direct to chefs from New York City, Las Vegas, Orlando, Chicago, Hong Kong, Dubai. And literally the light switch just flipped off. And there's 157 families that are employed here because what we're doing is not with giant machines where we come in and, and it's planted GMO and you come in with a machine and plant it and then you come in at the end of the year and harvest it. It's, it's, it's people related. We pick with scissors. We pick by hand. It's artisan. It's cottage industry craftsmanship of growing artisan, quality, nutritious, flavorful, sexy vegetables. And, you know, it just stopped. And the most important goal for us was to do everything we could to keep our team employed, to keep them fed, and keep them safe. And safe was in first priority. I didn't say that in any order, but keep them safe, keep them fed, keep them employed. And we did everything that we could to do that. But then secondary to that, we had all this product that was ready to go to restaurants and the restaurants are closed. We felt like we could do more to help society by making the product available than to individuals. So we launched a nationwide home delivery program. And the product became available to anybody anywhere in the United States. If you go to farmerjonesfarm.com, you can go online. It's a great gift. You want to get a box at home where you know that the people are being taken care of well and we're trying every way we can to produce the most nutritious product we can. You know, it's, 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 it helps save us during a rough time. Uh, we're seeing the restaurants return. We're going to keep the home delivery going so that we've got some assurance to fall back on. You know, who to thunk that this would have happened? Nobody. I mean, it's been horrific for all of us. But we also launched a, a market that we hadn't had um, in 40 years. And we opened a farm market right here on the farm to be able to open up to the community. And we're going to keep that going. So Yeah, that's growing. It's been great. Um, yeah. I work the market every Saturday. If anybody is around, uh, swing over and, uh, you know, come pick up some some uh, some carrots. I got you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, while um, you know, while the we were really focused on home delivery, there were just specific products that people at home weren't interested in. Um, at the Culinary Vegetable Institute, we've always been very focused on waste management and preservation, uh, fermentation, and really fun ways to like extend a product season. So we um, we really jumped hard into you know, shelf stable, preserved products. You know, and it went, ranged from you know a thousand pounds of sweet potatoes turned into like dog treats to, you know, flowers by the hundreds of thousands dried. They, they were just being plucked day. off to keep yeah. the plant alive and they're being plucked off and just thrown on the ground. And yeah. Amy yeah. and Tristan turned it into. Yeah. We made a line of tea. We have like five different varieties of tea. Down and they're down. pretty damn good. They're great. Yeah. They're great. Um, jams and jellies and marmalades and, um, you know, honeys, uh, different you know, sizes of honey products and, and even soap. We were, we were in like a soap factory for a few, uh, few weeks there. At the Anything we could do to get a base hit. Yeah. I mean, it was really survival mode and really desperation to try and keep the team going. But, you know, I've never been around a group of people that's more generous and more creative than the culinary industry. And the creativity that I saw happen in the last year in America, we've we, and maybe just in human nature all over the world, we figure out a way to survive. And it was unbelievable to see, you know, who would have thought that Daniel Hume at EMP would be serving over a million meals to folks that needed a meal or that Alinea in Chicago would now be doing more business in carry out than they did in fine dining. I mean, right. the creativity and those, those things aren't going to go away. It's not going to ever go back to the old normal. It's the new normal. And we found so many different, different ways. You guys are in such a great position right now to be emerging into this market because 
there's more job opportunities, more opportunities in than really than there's ever been in the history of the culinary. And it's it's a it's an exciting time. I've never personally been more excited about agriculture and the culinary world than I am today emerging out of this pandemic. It's really, really an exciting time. I really do hope you guys all stay in touch with us. Keep us posted on what you're doing with your personal paths and let us know if there's anything that we can do to help you. If you guys have got any questions, we're we're willing to try and answer them. Okay. Uh, to start with an unexpected vegetable from the farm, what should they order? You know, it depends on the season. Um, it depends on um, it depends on the farm, the region. Um, if I were right now, if I were, you know, looking at the chef's garden, you know, with a an open one, I would I would look for every single type of squash and zucchini um, available, you know, and and look at it at various stages of its life, you know, for us right now. We're going to be moving pretty quickly into like corn season. I want like little baby corn. You know, I want corn husks, I want corn flowers. I want uh, I want all the parts of the corn. Yeah, and I mean the silk and the husk become a tea. Yeah. There's no part that should be thrown away ever. You guys are more creative than that. Don't put anything in the garbage. Don't put anything in the compost. Use it. You know, this the single greatest question that I have ever gotten in 40 years from a chef is for them to call and say, Farmer, what am I putting on my menu next week? It's a brilliant question. Look at these guys that put asparagus on the menu in the middle of January and then are crying because they're paying $90 a case for it because it's coming in from Zimbabwe. Look at when stuff is at its best and at its best value, and I don't want to say the cheapest because I'm not trying to promote the cheapest, if you can imagine, and I don't know whether you can. But out here in the country, in the middle of the summer, on Sundays, we try and take it easy, and we try not to work if we don't have to. Kind of goes back to some old religious beliefs for us. Rest on Sunday. So we take a Sunday drive, and we go out in the country. And there's, a, if you can imagine a picnic table along the side of a road at an old farmhouse, and there's these beautiful tomatoes in quart baskets, and they're $3 for the basket. And there's a little can there that says self-serve. And you put the money in, or it says if you don't have three dollars, put in what you can. And if you got a little extra, put five in for the person that doesn't. And there's some of the very best quality product to, to best tomatoes you will eat in your life. Now it's January. The tomatoes aren't on the little picnic table, and you go in the grocery store, and they're six dollars a pound. And you'd be better off to throw the tomato away, away and eat the cardboard that the tomato was shipped in because there's no flavor. So the point is, is really understanding when this stuff is in season, understanding the ebbs and flows of when it's coming in, when it's going out, asking, communicating, know thy farmer. I can't reiterate that enough. Know the fisherman, know the bread maker, know the ebbs and flows of season and keep the menus flexible enough to be able to take advantage of what's in season. You go into the green market or go into a farmer's market, get an understanding of those issues that are happening on the farm. There are times when we plant one planting Let's say hypothetically green beans. It's the, it's the uh, first of May. We plant 12 rows of green beans. Then the next week we plant another 12 rows of green beans. And then the next week we plant another 12 rows of green beans. So you're trying to have a continuous supply. But the soil temperature's cold on the first of May. But now the, the 7th of May, the temperature's warmed up. So the beans that were in on the first planting weren't growing the first week, but now they take off. And so now, the first planting and the second planting yeah. are all ready at once. Rows. Yeah. So be willing to, to have a seasonal vegetable and take advantage of those ebbs and flows of when things, if the, if the beans gap, we planted them and there wasn't any rain and now we got a gap. Well, don't get it stuck where you're stuck on green beans. Flow with the summer squash that like it a little drier and like the heat and you move to the summer squash. Take advantage of seasonal vegetable. It, the vegetables day has arrived. Protein prices continue to skyrocket. Ferran Audria visited the farm about 10 years ago with Charlie Trotter. And Ferran made an interesting comment. He said, we've explored every species of pork, chicken, fish, uh, lamb that exists. Every species. Unless there's some rogue one on a mountain 
in the Andes someplace that we we missed somehow. <laughs> Highly unlikely, but so if you get the point, but there are literally thousands of plants to be explored yet. It is it is inevitable for sustainability that we move towards plant-based, plant-forward future for the environment and for our sustainability. And it's exciting. The vegetables day has arrived and it's not a fad. You know the difference between a fad and a trend. A fad is something that comes in and it goes away very quickly. A trend is evolving towards it. And we're evolving into a plant-based, plant-forward future. It is absolutely necess- it's a necessity for our sustainability. And um, it's exciting to think that we got it. Oh, they, there's a spider. Oh, they don't eat much. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have eight long legs. <laughs> um, live and let live. More important to that point, or, or not more important. But oh, also, thanks a lot. More important. Also important uh, to that point is, is you know, you look at the thir- the thirty year price fluctuation of the turnip, right, or the not much. Or the beef. It hasn't moved a whole lot, right? It's it's a yeah. high, highly profitable um, item to put in the center of your plate. Um, the restaurants today require uh, higher margins. You know, we have to be able to operate better uh and 10 days of cash flow after your restaurant shuts down and you have to close your business doors forever it makes no sense it's not sustainable uh restaurants looking at a uh, more sustainable future i think um, really should also consider looking at uh, the vegetables and bringing those to the center of the plate really for the sake of uh, of uh, profit margins as well i think that's a really important point not more important, <laughs> but it's an important one. But um, go ahead. Um, different restaurants that have visited, is that what you said? Yeah, at the Culinary Vegetable Institute, we will host around um, you know six hundred uh, visiting chefs a year. Uh, we have chefs. I have chefs in right now. One uh, from New Zealand. Um, the chefs are here to really get a better understanding of where their food comes from, how it's being grown, who's growing it, you know, and how do I bring it to the center of the plate? The chef's garden works with independent restaurants, um, resorts, trains, mm-hmm. boats, planes all over. We have chefs from all over. The Institute, the Culinary Vegetable Institute, I'll bring that back, has the ability to work with food service industries um, that, that the frankly, the chef's garden may not even be able to support. These are companies like Wendy's, Starbucks, right, like Google. Um, these are um, really interesting models that we had to look at and say, like, okay, how do I incorporate carrots on the Wendy's menu? <laughs> right? Like, this is different. Um, some of my favorite chefs and moments on the farm with chefs have been really bringing a chef into a field of carrots like this. Right. And they have no clue what they're standing in front of, you mm-hmm. know, and this light bulb moment goes off in the chef's head. And he says, like, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, pull it out. <laughs> yeah, these are carrots. Right. Like actually a field of carrots. But again, 40, 50 percent of the plant's mass is in the top. So now the chef gets to, like, have this discovery or this moment to say, like, this is the food. Right. Like the food is not just. Here, it's also really important to explore it here. And An it, amazing pesto out of the carrot top. Yeah, there's. I mean, it's a it's a unbelievable to see these light bulb moments go off with chefs uh, from all over the world. The, the challenges are the same, right? It's it's getting a better understanding of where our food comes from. You, know, you look at like really unbelievable um, isolated regions like like Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is like indigenous to all kinds of unbelievable ingredients. More commonly today, they're getting and losing touch with those foods, you know, and those, those fruits and those things. I think what, what's really happening, uh, you know, I, I guess we've got to give a lot of credit to Rene Rezepi, um, who's got chefs out of their kitchens and into fields and into woods and into rivers and into things and sort of reconnecting with, with where their food comes from. It's exactly why we're here, you know, at the Culinary Vegetable Institute. Uh, it's just been amazing, you know, to have the visiting chefs that we've had. About, like Jamie said, 600 visiting chefs a year. This last year, we didn't have visiting chefs. I mean, everybody was kind of in lockdown, as you know. 
Um, but we, we pivoted because the Culinary Vegetable Institute was built 22 years ago as a place for chefs to be able, the most forward thinking chefs to be able to come and to do R&D and R&R and to play menu development. Grant Ackett's brought his entire opening team before they opened Alinea. And they spent three days here playing with food in the test kitchen. And one of the guys that was on that opening team, Curtis Duffy, seven years later, brings his opening team here from Restaurant Grace, now Restaurant Ever. And, you know, and, and so it goes. And it's exciting. And a symbiotic relationship between the chef and the farmer working together. We learn from each other. And I think that that's where we're the most powerful. But, you know, so the chefs aren't coming, if you can imagine. So we pivoted to an Airbnb. And individuals that wanted a safe haven to be able to come with perhaps a culinary twist to it, they could come stay in the Culinary Vegetable Institute where some of the great chefs in the world have stayed. And uh, if the walls could talk, let me tell you. But, uh, um, you know, and if they want to do a, a chef's picnic basket along with the Airbnb dinner or a bottle of wine or something, again, you know, kind of going back to those base hits and really looking for the creativity to be able to move through this process we should do a, a an ice uh, field trip you know let's get everyone out um get the whole uh the whole student body in, in, including mr leas okay good you know we do have a rule you know after three days you're no longer a guest we will put you to work I think it's it's a it's a, a tactic. It's good. I think there are many tactics. One of the very best things that I can think of is, again, I guess I'm showing you just how old I am. When I was a kid, on Sunday night there was a show called Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, <laughs> and it was just a Mutual of Omaha is an insurance company, and they sponsored the show. And for farm kids, we didn't get off the farm much, and. Um, it was pretty neat for us because they took us to places like South Africa and different parts of the world that had only just been natural traffic for us and to see it live on television. And if you can imagine the tiger or the cougar is tracking down a herd of gazelle, which one do they go after? They go after the weak one because it's easier to catch. Insects operate under the exact same premise. And I really believe that Fundamentally, if you get the, the soil in balance and then you put a healthy vegetable into it, what's interesting is, is that the insects won't go after healthy plants. They go after weak plants. So planting an attractant plant away from there, you can pull them away. You can plant plants away from there that aren't healthy. But fundamentally, the basic thing is, is to get, have the soil in balance, put healthy vegetables into it because it actually tastes too sweet for the insect. Uh, if you have the insects, some of the things you can do, if it's offensive tasting to you, perhaps it's, in, um, it's offensive to the um, insect. You can think of the nastiest, hottest pepper and garlic, and you mix a concoction and you spray on, it's going to be offensive to that insect. Lots of tricks that you can do, but healthy soil and healthy vegetables. We actually have a machine, a couple of machines here. We buy a lot of our seed. If you can imagine, if you guys can imagine five pounds of seed, of carrot seed, okay? About 450,000 seeds in five pounds, okay? Smaller than a BB. There's a huge disparity between, and a direct correlation between the weight of the seed and the quality of the endosperm. So we actually sort the seeds into five different weight classifications, and then we'll take each of those weight classifications and put a small amount in a Petri dish and germinate them out. And almost every time, a heavier seed is a healthier seed. And so we'll sort, in some cases, we'll just send the, the lighter seed back to the seed company and say, it's an inferior product. We won't accept it and send it back to them. It's very rare that seed companies have had seeds rejected because of the weight of the seed. And the first time they really questioned us on what we were doing, it's like, the stuff is junk. We're not going to take it. Take it back. Give us good quality. If it's a rare seed, if we have a limited amount of seed, if we can't get the seed anyplace else, then maybe we're going to change how we handle that seed. If you don't put seeds into soil that's perfect for sprouting that seed, it's the germination is going to be low. Maybe 50% is going to sprout. Maybe 20% is going to sprout. If it's a limited amount of seed, if it's rare, if it's expensive, 
you don't want to put that put that out there in a in a difficult if the soil's too hot or if the soil's too cold, it's not going to sprout. So what we'll do is we'll create a perfect environment in in the uh, laboratory and put them at an ideal temperature in moisture and get them sprouted in a perfect world and then mix them into a gel solution and then put them into the ground pre-sprouted where we can sometimes get 95 to 98 percent germination on a seed that's pretty rare or pretty expensive and it's a way to be able to do a better job and when you get that seed sprouted and it can take off and it can be healthy and it's got nutrients for the roots to grab a hold of and take off you can the best defense against insects to answer the questions is good offense long answer to a short question that that, uh, that 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 pre pre germination stage is actually yet another use for a poly science immersion circulator. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, oh, thank you. So tell Rick, tell Rick Milo, we said hello. And Ashley, Michael, we have to ask. Thank you. See ya.